Okay, so here's uh, 2018 time zone 2, high level chemistry questions 11 to uh, 20. So what are the predicted electron domain geometries around the carbon and both nitrogen atoms in urea playing VSEPR? So what does urea look like? Well, if we just kind of sketch it down here, you get the C double bond O, and then you've got the NHs. And then you've got uh, lone pairs of electrons here, and also on the oxygen there as well. So the electron domain geometry around this carbon atom, where we've got one, two, three electron domains, double bond just counts as one, there's no lone pair, so that would be trigonal planar. So this one like right, this one, this one. The electron domain geometry around the nitrogen, where we've got one, two, three bonding pairs, plus we also have a lone pair. So the electron domain geometry will be tetrahedral, because that's four electron domains. The molecular shape around it, the shape would be trigonal pyramidal, because of course we don't see the lone pairs. However, it's asking for the uh, electron domain geometry, so there's four electron domains, they would go tetrahedral, even though the shape would be trigonal pyramidal. Which molecule has an expanded octet? Well, these are in period two, uh, so they can't have expanded octets. Period, expanded octets only start from period three onwards, so it can't be these two. And then, if you're looking at these ones, you start thinking, well, SF2, if you think sulfur group six likes forming two bonds to get a full out shell of eight electrons, then that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go with this one, but just to show how that's worked through as to what shape this would be with the expanded octet. If we sort of consider, right, sulfur is group uh, six, and then there's four fluorines, which are in group seven. So four sevens are 28 plus six, that's 34 electrons in our valid Lewis structure. So, okay, if we've got 34 electrons, how many of those are gonna be bonds? Well, how many times does eight go into 34? Uh, it goes into it four times, so that's four bonds. And then we've got a remainder of two. Uh, so that is one lone pair. So our sulfur has got four bonds coming off it, which makes sense, there's four fluorines, and it's also got one lone pair as well, so it would be like this. I'll show the lone pairs on the fluorines uh, for speed sake with lines. There's the lone pairs on our fluorines, and there's also a lone pair on the sulfur there. So the sulfur's actually got uh, 10 electrons around it. Uh, so it's got an expanded octet, whereas in SF2, it would just be this, basically. So here, sulfur is a big in the octet rule. It's got eight electrons around it, so we want to go with D. Question 13, which overlap of atomic orbitals leads to the formation of only a sigma bond? Uh, okay, well, what's not a sigma bond, it's a pi bond, and of course a pi bond is formed by the sideways overlap of p orbitals. So whilst p orbitals can overlap to give us pi bonds, if they overlap head on, a sideways overlap uh, could also lead to a pi bond. So we're not gonna go with this one because it can also give you a pi bond if they overlap sideways. S and P, well the shape of the S is a sphere, so there's only really one way that it can overlap. So S and P will give you a sigma bond, should be like that. Again, S and S would be like that. So that could only give you a sigma bond. Whereas, yeah, the P and P would be like that. But they've also got this sideways overlap as well, which then gives results in a pi bond. Sigma, sigma, sigma. So it's one and three only, so we're gonna go with B. Question 14, which best describes the reaction shown in the potential energy profile? Well, we can see the products are a higher in energy than the reactant, so it's endothermic. So we can rule out that one and that one. And then what have we got then? The products have greater enthalpy than the reactants. Well, higher in energy, essentially, is what we say. And well, yes, they are. The products are higher in energy or uh, at a higher enthalpy than the reactants. So we're going to go with this one. That one's a fairly obvious one. Okay, question 15. Two 100 centimeter cubed aqueous solutions, one containing 0 0.01 molar sodium hydroxide and the other 0 0.01 molar HCl at the same temperature. When the two solutions are mixed, temperature rises by y degrees c. Assume the density is 1, specific capacity 4.18. Okay, so what is the enthalpy change in neutralization? Remember, that's basically delta H is Q over M. And what is Q? Well, that's MC delta T uh, divided by M. Uh, Okie dokie.
So what we've got then, if we substitute in our values, well, the total mass of the solution, we've got two 100 centimetre cubed solutions mixed together. So the total mass is going to be 200, assuming the density is 1. So and that rules out this one already. And then we've got to times by 4.18, which is the specific heat capacity. And then we've got to times that by uh, the temperature rise, the temperature increase, which is y degree C. Um, it's already said that the temperature rises by y, so if that's a temperature change, that would be the same in degree C or Kelvin, so we just need to times it by y. We don't need to bother adding 273 because it's a temperature change. And then what we need, of course, on the bottom is n. So we're actually already given n here. We're not given uh, the, the concentrations of these solutions. We're given the number of moles in each of them. Now, we only have it with regard to one of them. So we don't add the two numbers of moles together. We just pick whichever one happens to be limiting. In this case, they're both essentially limiting because they react in a one-to-one -one fashion. So we just do it with respect to moles of sodium hydroxide or with respect to moles of HCl. So it's going to be 0 0.01 is our number of moles. And then, of course, that... Because this is in grams, our answer is going to be in joules. So if we want to then convert it into kilojoules per mole, as it says, we would then have to take that final value and divide it by a 1,000. So then we'd also have to put a 1,000 on the bottom because we divide by that. So which one is the best match? Well, it's this one here. Number 16, we've got a bone harbor cycle. Uh, so which value represents the lattice entropy in kilojoules per mole of strontium chloride? Okay, so we need to get from there to there, but of course we don't know that, so we've got to come up here instead. So this arrow is going in the wrong direction, so we'd have to flip that. So that would become plus 829. Uh, these arrows are all going in the correct direction, so we'd keep those the same. So that would be plus 164, plus 243, plus 550, plus... 1064 and then our final arrow we've got to come down here that arrow is also going in the right direction so we'd leave the sign the same so that is minus 698 so that's what we're looking for as our sum so okay we need a plus 829 at the start then so we can eliminate these two already because they start with a minus 829 so it must be one of these two notice the rest of it is all very similar it's once we get to the final bit well, we need the 698 to be minus at the end, and this one here, of course, would make it plus. So we're going to go with this answer in here. That would be C. Okay, so again, just follow it through. Flip the arrows when you need to. So that one's going in the wrong direction. Flip it, and therefore flip the sign until you get uh, to where you need to go. Question 17, which system has the most negative entropy change, delta H for the forward reaction? Uh, so a negative entropy change, remember, signifies a, a system that is becoming more ordered uh, rather than disordered. So uh, a positive entropy change would be a system becoming more disordered, which is where reactions tend to want to go. So nitrogen plus free hydrogens, we've got four molecules of gas becoming two molecules of gas. So this system is becoming more ordered, so that would be a negative entropy change. So that would be, that's looking like a good possibility. This one, we've got a solid becoming another solid plus a gas. So this one's releasing a gas. So this one is going to be a, a positive entropy change because it's becoming more disordered because it's creating a gas. This one here, uh, well, there's not a lot going on there really. We've got three mobile ions at the start or three substances swimming around in solution at the start. We've got free substances swimming around solution in the end. So there's probably not going to be that much of an entropy change to this. Certainly it won't be as great as this one. If it did happen to be negative, this one's going to have a far bigger impact because we've got four molecules of gas becoming two. So I'm not really liking that one. And then this one, we've got a liquid becoming a gas. Well, again, if you get a gas being created, that's a big uh, positive change in entropy. So it won't be this one. So we're going to go with A. Number 18, potential energy profile for the reverse reaction, X plus Y going to Z is shown. Which arrow represents the activation energy for the reverse reaction, Z going to X plus Y? Okay, so this is the activation energy without a catalyst. So this is the activation energy with a catalyst, and we want the reverse reaction going from here to here. So we'll want to go with C. Be careful not to label Z. 19, which factors can affect the rate of reaction? Uh, particle size, well, yeah, the particle size, bigger surface area means a faster uh, rate of reaction. Concentration, yes, a higher concentration means a faster rate, because again, as before, higher frequency of collisions. And pressure, yes, a greater pressure, greater frequency of collisions, faster rate of reaction. So all three of those will 
affect the rate of our reaction. And last but not least, 20D. Uh, what do we got going on? So 20, when x reacts with y to give z, the following graphs plotted, what can we deduce? Well, we've got a concentration time graph. And there's three you need to know, basically. And you just want to be aware of those. So for two of them, you get more of the curve. And with the curve, it's a bit trickier to spot. They will be first or they will be uh, second order. If it's first order, you'd get a constant half-life. Uh, second order tends to be a bit steeper. Uh, but uh, that's why it's better to have a, uh, a rate concentration graph because then it's a bit more obvious uh, to tell what's going on but this one is very diagnostic so this straight line going down that's telling you it's zero order so you just really want to know that so this is zero order that as the concentration decreases it actually has no effect on the time and that's why there's sort of none of this kind of uh, inversely proportional business uh, so it's going to be this one okay yeah if it was directly proportional to time well, you'd get a relationship go like that then, wouldn't you? Because uh, that's not really proportional that we go in. And then, yeah, if it was first order with respect to x, you'd get a curve going like that. And the curve would have a constant half-life. So we go with Z.